Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast. Our church's vision is to have a passion for God and compassion for people. We hope that the teachings in this podcast will encourage you as you seek to follow Christ and grow in your faith. Now, let's get into today's message. Good morning and happy Easter. It's great to be here with you. My name's Clark and I'm the pastor here. And if we've never met, I would love to meet you and I'd love to meet your family afterwards. So feel free to stick around and I'd love to chat with you a little bit. And as Julie mentioned a little bit ago in those announcements, if you are a first time guest with us here this morning, uh, number one, thank you so much for being here. There's a lot of things you could be doing today with your time, including sleeping in a little bit. But I uh, just want to say, take advantage of making your way to our Next Steps table out in the lobby. Uh, that first time guest gift bag, uh, we'd love to give that to you. If anything, you get a free coffee mug out of it. So, so there's that. If you don't drink coffee, you can drink your tea out of there. You can drink, anyway, I'm just going to stop while I'm ahead. But anyway, we just, we just want to say thank you for being here. Happy Easter. Well, as we heard in our scripture reading, uh, the tomb was empty. There's lots of possible explanations for that. For example, uh, scenario number one, maybe the disciples came and they stole Jesus' body and then invented the story of the resurrection. Maybe that's a scenario. After all, they had a vested interest in Jesus' this whole Jesus thing altogether, didn't they? Maybe they came by night and they took Jesus' body and then they told everybody that he rose from the dead. Maybe that's a possible scenario. I mean, that's the story that was told by the Roman soldiers and the Jewish officials on the first Easter Sunday. And it's a story that continues to be repeated even to this day. Here's a second scenario for you, though. Maybe the women and the disciples on Easter Sunday morning went to the wrong tomb. Maybe they went to the wrong tomb. I mean, they are disoriented with grief. They likely had not slept very much in the preceding couple of nights. There were tombs all over the hillside outside of Jerusalem. So maybe in their disorientation and in their grief, they just ended up at the wrong tomb. And maybe they just thought that Jesus rose from the dead. But really, they were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Here's a third scenario. Scenario number three. Maybe Jesus didn't really die, like all the way. Maybe he was on the verge of death. Maybe he was passed out and unconscious, but not expired, and they took him down from the cross, and then perhaps, perhaps in the coolness of the tomb, he revived. Maybe what they were really talking about here is not so much a resurrection, but a resuscitation. These theories that I just mentioned, and dozens of others have been put forward by skeptics and doubters for centuries now. And here's my point in bringing those forward to us this morning, or this Easter Sunday morning. My point is for us to acknowledge this. An empty tomb does not a resurrection make. An empty tomb is interesting. An empty tomb demands some kind of explanation. But an empty tomb does not equal a resurrection. There are other ways of explaining it. And it wasn't the Jerusalem agnostic club that first doubted the significance of the empty tomb. It was Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' most beloved followers. And what we see in Mary Magdalene's response to the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday is this. We see that faith is about the risen Christ, not about the empty tomb. Christian faith is a response to the risen Christ, not a response to the empty tomb. I want to explore the difference between these two things because it matters deeply for how we understand the central message of Christianity. Faith is a response to the risen Christ, not a response to the empty tomb. Or to say it another way, Christian faith is not about belief in an event, but about trust in a person. It's the risen Christ, not the empty tomb, that makes the difference. So the way I'd like to structure our time together this Easter morning is simple. I want us to look at, number one, 
Mary's encounter with the empty tomb. But then secondly, I want us to look at Mary's encounter with the risen Christ. So let's look first of all at Mary's encounter with the empty tomb. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. And listen, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, that's fine. We'll have the words up on the screen for you, and you could follow along that way as well. But let's explore Mary's encounter, first of all, with the empty tomb. So here's the setting. It's the first Sunday, uh, the first Easter Sunday morning. Mary and some of the other followers of Jesus have come to the tomb early, not to celebrate the resurrection, not to see if Jesus really did rise from the dead, like he said, but rather to continue preparing the body for burial. Jesus' body was buried rather hastily, had been sort of embalmed or anointed in the customary manner, and so these women were bringing spices hoping to sort of finish the job, take care of the deceased body of the Lord Jesus. So that's the setting here this morning. So John chapter 20, verse 11, let's dive in together. It says this, Now Mary stood outside of the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. So let's, first of all, try to get ourselves in the mindset and the emotional state that Mary's in at this moment. The text tells us twice that she's weeping. It's highlighting the reality of grief, pain, loss that she is feeling. So this morning for you, where's the grief? Where's the loss? Where's the heartache in your life and in your story? Would you go there and would you allow yourself to feel those feelings even this morning? Allow yourself to feel what it would be like to enter into the first Easter Sunday in that emotional state. Sad, grieving, facing death, loss, pain and grief. Maybe for some of you that is a very present reality for you even right now. That's where we find Mary. And I want you to admire with me Mary's emotional health She's not numb to the fact of death. She's not ignoring the pain of losing someone close to her. She's not trying to put it in the past and just simply move on. She's doing what emotionally healthy people do. She's crying. She's weeping. She's allowing herself to feel the reality of death, the loss of a dear friend and mentor. So this is the state that she is in. And verse 12 tells us, and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Sort of an odd question, right? If there's any place where crying and weeping is a normal response, it's a cemetery, right? At a gravesite. You don't go to cemeteries to find people alive with celebration and happiness, If there's any place in the world where you would not be surprised to find someone broken down in grief, it's at a place of death, a place where people are entombed, a gravesite. So what an odd question to ask. Woman, why are you crying? Well, it would make sense. And this is the first clue in the story that maybe there's a happy ending here. Maybe Mary's emotional response to the situation isn't taking into account what's really taking place. However, notice Mary's response. They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Here it's happening here. Mary, one of Jesus' most beloved followers, one of his closest disciples, is here at the tomb. The tomb is empty. She's just seen two angels although we might surmise that she doesn't reckon that they're angels at the moment. She's a little disoriented. And the resurrection doesn't even enter into her mind. She doesn't have a category for, oh, hang on a second, Jesus said something about rising from the dead. Maybe that's what's going on here. Rather, her response is, they, whoever they are, have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they laid him. 
This is one of the reasons I love the Bible. One of the reasons I find the Bible to be accurate and honest. Because it reports the honest doubt and unbelief that surrounded the events of Jesus' life and death. Think about it this way. If you're making up a hero story, a story where, of course, Jesus rose from the dead because he's the hero, wouldn't we expect that to happen? If you're making up that kind of story, you don't write the part where Mary goes, uh, where have they put the body? Because that kind of doubt and unbelief reveals the honesty and the authenticity of the scriptural accounts. The category of the resurrection doesn't even enter into her mind. Having said that, notice what happens next in verse 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize one is active disbelief. Active disbelief. This one's really easy to spot. It's when someone thinks or says, hey, this, this God stuff is just bunk. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't have time for that. It's all crazy. The Bible is regressive and archaic and primitive. I don't want to have anything to do with that Jesus stuff. And maybe there's some of you here this morning and watching online, and that's the place where you are. But probably not the majority of you. There's active disbelief, sort of the skeptical rejection, but then there's a different kind of skepticism that we might call passive detachment. Passive detachment, that kind of skepticism looks like this. It's when we might think or say, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing does not fit the way that I already see the world. In other words, I see what seems to be here, but I find myself detached from it. I find myself having a hard time entering into it and fully embracing it. There's a way that I'm already accustomed to seeing reality, and this doesn't fit. Can you see that that's exactly where Mary Magdalene is in this story? Resurrection is not a category that we normally operate in. When you go to a tomb and there's a body that's not there, the first answer is not resurrection. The first answer, the knee-jerk reaction for us to say is to think, who took the body? Who took the body and where did they put it? So I wonder if we could just acknowledge this morning that for many of us, what our doubt and our skepticism looks like is sort of this passive detachment that sort of says, I understand the story that Christian theology is telling. I'm just not sure that I can enter into it as deeply as maybe I'm invited to. I kind of just want to stand at a distance and hold this at arm's length and say, hmm, maybe. My guess is that there's a lot of us where we find the state of our souls in that sort of way this morning, even, even this morning as we come back to the story of the resurrection. And if that's, if that's you this morning, you're in good company. Mary Magdalene is right there with you. She's not this active, hostile disbeliever. In fact, she appreciates and enjoys Jesus. But the resurrection does not fit the way she currently sees the world, and so she finds herself detached, unable to see the hints that the story resolves in a different way than it seems to make sense to her. So that's Mary's encounter with the empty tomb. She comes to the tomb. The angels and Jesus ask, why are you crying? And her answer is, because the body's not here. Can you tell me who took it and where they took it so that I can go and anoint it for burial? What happens next is Mary encounters not just the empty tomb, but the risen Christ. And so I want us to turn now from looking at Mary's encounter with the fact or the reality or the data of the empty tomb and I want us to turn to looking at Mary's encounter with the person of Jesus Christ now. Notice Jesus has already showed up in the story, right? She just doesn't know that it's Jesus. She assumes that it's the gardener. But Jesus already has stepped in. And now notice what happens in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. 
The next thing that happens is you. This is going to happen for some of you even this morning. That you sense that Jesus is speaking your name. And it's not Jesus showing up in a way that he did for Mary Magdalene, but it's through his word and it's through his spirit, this sense of, wow, he is calling out to me. Jesus is speaking to me, and it's personal all of a sudden. And notice what happens next. The Bible tells us she turned. She turned. Think about it this way. When you're in a crowded space, like if you're at the mall or you're at a ballpark, and somebody calls out your name, what do you do? Well, if you're anything like me, you turn around and you're looking to see whoever called out your name. The same thing happens spiritually. When Jesus calls your name, when Jesus begins to encounter and reach out to you personally, you turn. Mary hears Jesus speak her name. She turns and she responds, not in Greek, but in Aramaic, which is a Hebrew dialect. It's Mary's heart language. It's probably the first language that she grew up hearing. It's the language that was spoken in her household before she had to learn Greek and learn to make it in society. It's a language of intimacy and childlikeness. Her response is not Lord in the Greek, rather it's teacher in Aramaic. The point is, there's a heart level response to Jesus. And this is how you understand whether you've really experienced and turned to, encountered the living person of Jesus Christ. The question is, has it come from the heart? Is there an affection that just pulls you in and just says, Jesus? This isn't just about facts. It's not just about data and cerebral realities. This is about intimacy. This is about soul. You know the risen Christ. You look at the empty tomb and you feel something. Christian faith is not belief in an event. It is trust in a person. So here's the question that I think puts before us on this Easter Sunday morning. In other words, here's the question this makes us ask. Have you encountered the living Christ, or have you merely encountered the empty tomb? Have you come to trust in a person, or do you merely have belief in an event? Let me explain what I mean. According to Pew Research, Pew Research Center in New England, 70% of Americans would affiliate with the Christian religion. They would call themselves Christians. And you can argue the stats of whether they're counting, what they're counting and what they're not counting, but here's the point. 70% of the people in our country would affiliate with the Christian religion. And here's what that means. It means that a lot of us believe in the story of the empty tomb, but it's quite possible that for many of us in our actual lives, we don't know Jesus from the gardener. It's possible to believe in the story of the empty tomb and have no personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus risen and reigning and changing you. And listen, belief in the story of the empty tomb is a kind of belief. In other words, it's a type of faith, and it's not unimportant, but it's not the kind of belief and faith that can save you and change you and transform you. Let me try to explain it this way. I believe in the dentist. I believe in dentists. I believe that they exist. I believe in the vocation that they practice. And I even believe that I should, if I need dental work done, that they would be good people to call. Are you with me? That's the kind of belief that I mean when I talk about belief in the story of the empty tomb. It's an assent that says, yep, sure. Yep, I got that. That happened. That's what Christians believe. I don't have a problem with that story. I'm not even skeptical about it. Sure, that's great. Just like I'm not skeptical about dentists. I know that they exist, and I have no problem with the work that they do in our communities. Great. But a few weeks ago, I started to have some pain in one of my back molars. And it got to the point where I was like, wow, I better go to the dentist. So we called the dentist who made the appointment, showed up at the dentist's office, and the dentist was like, yeah, there's a problem with his tooth. In fact, it's probably going to involve either a root canal or maybe an extraction. So whether it's at my dentist or whether it's at an oral surgeon, I'm going to have to lay there in a dental truly encountered and trusted in the living Christ. 
Or have you come to Him for healing and for wholeness? Have you come to Him and given yourself to Him in trust? Only an encounter with the risen Christ can change us. Christian faith is an encounter with the living Christ. It's not belief in an event, it's trust in a person. The living, active Jesus Christ who has risen, who is reigning, who is powerful, and who is present this morning. That can change even you. It could change even you. No matter who you are, no matter what your story is, no matter what you're facing right now, I want to invite you to wrestle that question to the ground. This morning, have you trusted in the living Christ? Have you encountered the living Christ or have you just merely become familiar with the story of the empty tomb? Let's pray together. Well, Jesus, we acknowledge that we could be a lot like Mary Magdalene. It's hard for us to be confronted with the reality of the resurrection. Lord, speak personally to someone this morning to trust in the real risen Christ, to take them from belief in an event into trusting a person. Those of us who believe, help us to go, help us to proclaim, help us to announce, to declare, help us to go and tell the world the good news about the resurrected, transforming Jesus Christ. For our good, for your glory. Amen. Our church's mission is to follow God, share his truth, and be examples of the love of Jesus to all. If you would like to know more about us, you can visit our website at www.ritmangrace.org or drop by anytime for one of our in-person Sunday morning worship services. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Ritman Grace Podcast.